Hello, 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 everybody. It is me, Juliet, here. Uh, today, I'm super, super, super excited to be here because I'm going to be interviewing the owner of the world's largest concierge company ever in the face of ever, all right? So, um, as we get started here, let me make sure that I share this to the appropriate priests while we wait for Steve to get on here. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? Good to I'm okay. Now. Thank you. You blew up my ears when you popped on. It was like so loud. It startled me. <laughs> All right, Steve, I'm super excited to have you here. Um, I've got a lineup of questions from people in my audience that they wanted me to ask you. But before we dive into it, I'm not great at introductions, so I like my people to introduce themselves. So why don't you tell people who you are, what you do, and why it is that you think that I chose to interview you? It's because of my male modeling career, I think, predominantly. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think people find me um, refreshing in the fact that I'm a blunt instrument from East London. I'm a, I'm a, uh, a bricklayer that now happens to do things with Elon Musk, the Pope, uh, uh, Sir Elton John, Richard Branson. Um, for 20 plus years, I was leading the, and still am, the world's leading experiential concierge firm. That means that we do all of these wonderful things like send people down to the Titanic and closed down museums. Um, about two years ago, I was a big deal to maybe 3% of the planet. Uh, they just happen to own things like countries. Um, and then uh, I launched a book. And then I started taking the branding and the consulting that I had done with uh, events like the Grammys and the New York Fashion Week. And I started applying that to entrepreneurs, solopreneurs and, um, you know, small businesses. So I, I have led the field from Poverty, well, not poverty, but just not wealthy in London right. to dealing with people with obscene amounts of wealth and um, now just uh, doing a lot of speaking gigs and consulting and just getting around to show people that you are usually the biggest problem. <laughs> right. Cool. So let's dive into that a little bit. I know when I met you, something that was really interesting to me was how you went from being a bricklayer to someone who's connected to some of the world's wealthiest people. Um, whenever I ask you about it, you kind of brush it off like, ah, it's no big deal. I just sort of met them. Um, but I think a lot of people are are struggling to go from like their nine to five job or their like something that they hate to creating the life of their dreams. So um, talk a little bit about how you made that happen. What was like the first step from bricklayer to I'm going to do something bigger? Like what was what was the aha moment that you needed to do something different? Uh, selfish. Um, as entrepreneurs, we know, and uh, we've had these conversations before, we are awkward in areas that we don't fit until we find where we fit and then we dominate. And entrepreneurs are quite honestly a lot of people that are getting into trouble because they're frustrated. We've got ADD, we've got lack of focus, <laughs> we've got lack of energy because right. we haven't found that thing that challenges us. So being a big, ugly uh, East London boy um, back then, I was certainly not the guy you wanted to knock around with because I was a loose cannon. I didn't know where I fit. I was literally, is this my life? And one of my big aha moments, and funny enough, I can still smell the tobacco, I can still smell the tea, but I was on a building site with my dad, my granddad, my uncle, and my cousins. Mm. And so my cousins being just a little bit older than me and my granddad being in his 70s, I saw every generation of my family on the same building site. And I remember going into the tea hut at 10 o'clock in the morning, stupidly, yeah, yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning, run into the tea hut, have a cup of tea and your sandwich. And um, I saw my granddad there just undoing his sandwich and drinking his tea, cold, wet. And I asked him a stupid question. I said, is this what you always wanted to do? Which stupid question in your 70s. And he just looked at me and he said, if you don't quit today, you'll be me tomorrow. Now, my family is not known for being poetic, but this kind of was like, he's right, you know, because time, we know time flies. So let's jump in. So um, I went through loads of different jobs, but I had a hunger and a thirst and was selfish. I was selfish to the point that as a bricklayer with no money, uh, running around on broke ass motorcycles, not knowing anyone that could mentor, direct, coach, uh, um, nurture me. 
Um, I wanted more for my life. So that, that total selfishness, I wanted to meet people that were affluent. So that's what I started doing. If you want to meet people that are affluent, you don't go to Denny's at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, unless it's us when we're in, you know, um, Reno or something, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, you go to a, a, a Wolfgang Puck restaurant or you go to Spargo or you go to the, the Four Seasons. So I started doing that. Literally, I started just hanging them out in wealthy places because I wanted to know what made you different to me. So I was a very inquisitive young Irish lad that really wanted to be successful, really wanted to be engaged, really wanted everything out of life that you were seeing on the movies, um, wasn't willing to accept where I was, but didn't know anything else. So that's how it started. And the funny thing was, the worst job I got was the best one. I actually got a job working on a, a rather seedy little nightclub in Hong Kong. Yeah. But all of a sudden, it gave me this pedestal to watch humanity. And most entrepreneurs, and I know me and you have a similar in this, we like to watch people. The psychology behind yeah. what we do can often be more interesting than the end product. You know, you look at it and you're going, hang on, so that lights your, bu your buzzer? Right. <laughs> mm, interesting. So being the doorman, I was literally stood on there staring at humanity going, so you think you're cool, you are cool. And I'd be amazed, and I've used this example before, people would drive up in a fancy car, and when they get out of the car, that's the moment you discover, are they driving the car or is the car driving them? Are they wearing the $5,000 suit or is the $5,000 suit wearing them? And there is a difference, and you can notice it. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine that, owns a massive great Ferrari dealership in Texas. And he said to me, the guy that comes into the dealership on a Saturday wearing a suit can't afford a car. The guy that comes in on a Tuesday wearing a pair of shorts and raggedy sneakers, he's probably on his third. So it's about your confidence and the aura you give off. So I really just started by trying to get to know affluent people yeah. to get the answer that I wasn't getting from anywhere else. Okay. Yeah, that's really, really interesting, actually. So... I want to ask you, one, well, one of the viewers wanted me to ask you, um, and everything that you've done, so you've done a lot of different really insane things, like what you, didn't you get someone under um, that painting in the church? What is that painting? Help me out here. Painting under the church? The painting in the church, the ceiling, the David. Oh, um, no, the David, uh, David's a statue. Um, no, it was, no. uh, there was the David statue in Florence um, okay. that we had the dinner and uh, we had the, uh, yeah, so we, t we, we took over an entire museum and set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And then uh, just for shits and giggles, I had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them while they were eating their pasta. Right. So you've done a lot of crazy stuff like that. Of everything that you've accomplished, everything that you've done in the concierge business, what has been your like, greatest feat? Like, What's something that you're most proud of? Um... Again, it goes down to the psychology, and I don't look. I get I get paid well. I get to travel the world. I get into places that I never would have thought I would have got into. But the biggest kick is still to me when the client calls me like three years later and says, "Hey, I just woke up last night dreaming that I I did this, and I just wanted to reach out to you and say thank you." You know, we can all sit and go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure you do," but. Seriously, that's what it is. You know, you've met me. I'm a very grounded, uh, down to earth, pretty dull person, to be honest with you. I like drinking me whiskey and talking about motorbikes and hanging out with people I like. Um, mm. I don't care about being in, in, in Monaco in the Casino Royale. I, 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 I don't care about it. I don't care about being in Elton John's party every year. You know, I enjoyed being in prison with you the other week and just having conversations with people and being challenged to see a new perspective. So um, I would say that anything that challenges me, I'm very excited about. Anything that puts me into a room that makes me slightly uncomfortable, uh, I'm very happy about because I'm a great um, pursuer, I suppose, of growth. So people would want me to say, oh, it's getting people married in the Vatican and actually meeting the Pope or hanging out with Elon Musk. But... 
you can get so much information out of a valet boy or out of a uh, studio technician or, you know, someone behind the camera. So mm -hmm. knowledge can come from many different angles. So I just, I just yearn for growth. And um, when I stop growing, that's when the problem is going to kick in. All right. So you yourself have reached quite high levels of success and you've met some very, very successful people, some billionaires um, in your life. And I notice, at least in my own life, that there's often a few characteristics that are different between the people that make it, they make it fast and they make it big and they are able to sustain it. And the people that just don't, you know, like some, a lot of people start businesses or they start projects and it takes them years to get it off the ground, years to do anything with it. And then other people seemingly, you know, it's never like that behind the scenes, but mm. outwardly it looks like it came easy to them. They reached super high levels. So because you've met so many different people and you've had your own success in your life, what do you think are some of shared characteristics between the world's most successful people and everybody else? So there's two, and it's a very good, brilliant question, okay? There, there's two. First, first common, not common, but first trait between every single one of my clients, whether it be the, the rich concierge clients or my consultant clients, is they're all failures, okay? They fail, they fail often, they fall over, they come from heartache, they come from pain, things went belly up, shit up, bankruptcy, whatever, but it went south. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that's common with all of them is that they didn't care about who saw this and they didn't care about certain people's opinions. You see, nowadays, we've got TV shows that are focusing on people falling over, you know, and we laugh at it. So when you try and, you try and come out and you go, hey, I'm going to make a, a, a hair product, you know, and people go, yeah, Yo, you can't do that, that's stupid. The successful person is the person that looks at the people saying that and laughing at you and going, well, okay, is that a qualified perspective? You know, why are you doing this? Nine times out of 10, the people that sit around the corner going, you can't do that. They don't want you because it's going to show up their inadequacies. So they're challenging you to stay at that level. Okay. So the two things are, and, and, and Elon Musk said this to me in SpaceX, he said, they'll laugh at you before they applaud. Now, every single one of the people you can think of, Jean-Paul de Jouria, brilliant entrepreneur. Look up that guy's life history. Fantastic guy. Um, Richard Branson, how many virgin products have failed? Okay. Uh, Elon Musk, how many times do you see in the newspaper, Tesla's going into bankruptcy? Those rockets are never going to land vertical. Solar City, what a waste of time. Okay. None of these people care about your opinion when it comes from an unqualified position. So they fail, they fail often, they learn the education from where they fail, and they apply it to making them more successful. I remember when the rockets were trying to vertically land the reusable fuel cells, yeah. and they kept on landing on that uh, platform, falling over and exploding. Right. And you would see it every couple of weeks. Oh, another one explodes. That's millions of dollars down the pan. Elon sat there going, okay, we learned where that went wrong. We right. just spent a million dollars on learning where, we, where it went, went wrong, okay? Now, it lands vertically. When was the last time you saw one of those rockets land on the platform? I actually don't know. No, why? Because it bloody works now. Right. <laughs> people, people, like, people like to see failures. We like to console ourselves right. in things going wrong. All the time it's failing, we're going to stare at it, you know, because it's like a train wreck. You're going to go, oh, look at this, it's going wrong. As soon as it goes right, we're bored, okay? It doesn't excite us. So that's the difference. They fail, they fail often, they fail up and they're educated from it, and they don't like, let their mistakes define them. They allow it to refine them. And secondly, they don't give a shit what you think. They're focused on what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, I find that um, I find that really interesting. I've always wanted to ask you that question because I think you have unique insight being friends with the people that you're friends with. So if they fail often and they don't care what people think, why do you think it is that so many people that are getting started in business or projects or the careers, whatever, resist that so much? Why do you think that it would be easier or why do you think Elon – um, would embrace his failures versus everybody else try to avoid them? What, what's the difference there? 
Why do you think people are afraid? Well, again, harking back to, to our recent prison visit, you're quite often a byproduct of your, your location and circumstance. Right. And nine times out of 10, you know, for every entrepreneur, there's 400 that are not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're in an environment and you're thinking, hey, I'm going to do this. You're trying to break out of a box with 400 other people and those 399 are looking at you going, you stay here. That's a silly idea. And what happens is it kind of builds up in you that I have to listen to those. You know, you go to school with someone for like 20 years and they're okay because they're still flipping burgers at McDonald's, but you actually want to go out and launch a software. And what's the first thing you do? You speak to your mate flipping burgers and he says, that's a stupid idea. And you go, oh yeah, well, I've known you for 20 years. It must be true. You know, we, we are a victim of our environment and we listen to the wrong people. The first thing that I really learned as a young lad, and again, another thing that I've learned from the people that, that I deal with is you have to, on a regular basis, audit your circle. You need to learn. Now, if you're a young entrepreneur, if you're in a startup business, look at the people around you, okay? Are they challenging you? Are they motivating you? Are they supporting you? Or are they the naysayers? Are they the ones that are taking the piss out of your ideas? Are those the ones that are going, oh, you can't do that, and then not giving you a reason? I've got people that turn around to me, and they go, you can't do that. And I go, really? And they go, yes, because the regulations are this, this, this. Maybe you should look at doing it from this angle. You go, okay. It's different, yeah. Those people are helping you avoid pain and then helping challenging you into a different direction. Or they can say, well, actually, I tried that 10 years ago and I failed for this reason. Therefore, use my failures to get you a couple of steps advance. Those people are encouraging, they're supporting, they're there to help you go forward. Mm. So you've got to look at your circle and find out who's actually helping me, who's challenging me, who's focusing me, who's refining me. When I fall down, Who's the one that's going to help lift me up and then kick me in the ass to get running again? You know, those are the people you want. And it's tough. And that's where the selfish aspect comes in. I remember when I started looking at my circle and they say that you are the combination of the five people you hang around with. I looked at my five people and they were broke ass bikers. And I was <laughs> like, well, that's you know, <laughs> yeah, we're not exactly going to be having a big party here, are we? So I had to get away from those and start redefining my new social circle. And so I'm a great believer that look at the source of the comment. If someone's looking at you going, yeah, you can't do that. Why are they saying that? You know, nine times out of 10, because you, they don't want you to do it because it'll prove their inadequacies. But they may have something behind it. They may be intelligent. If I wanna, if I wanna grow a, uh, a genius network for argument's sake, I'll phone up Joe Polish and go, hey, is this a good idea? And they'll go, well, these are the pitfalls, these work. I'm looking at a person of credibility. And I think today, with our add water, pop, here's an Insta guru kind of, of uh, mentality, I look at people and I go, yeah, yeah, you look important because you're leaning up against that really ugly Lamborghini. But let me look at where the source is coming from. Let me look at where the credibility is. And you don't have to dig too far now to find that a lot of these people are shallower than toilet paper. So I'm a great believer in audit your circle, surround yourself with those people that challenge and nurture and support you and ask for credibility or ask for where the credibility is in any comment that's coming your way. Okay, I like that because um, a lot of people come to me and will ask me uh, similar questions like, Julia, what, what makes the difference or what can I do? And, um, or I have these really unsupportive people in my life and what can I do about it? And I think a lot of times the cold hard truth is that you just need to cut them out and find get them out, right? And and find the people that will support you. Um, but a few seconds ago, we were talking about people's biggest failures and how the really successful people embrace the failures. They learn from them. They're okay with them. They use them and then they grow. Um, so, do you mind sharing with us what has been your what you consider to be your biggest failure in business? Do you mind? Ooh, ooh, I think yeah. the screen's, I think the screen's frozen. <laughs> um, all right, so there's been, God, what was the biggest one? So I basically fail every week. Um, 
don't if care I don't... about that. I care about the biggest yeah. one. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I fail and I fail a lot. So what are some of the big aha moments? One big failure that I... So there's two I'm going to give you. One big failure was in 1997, 50th anniversary of Ferrari. I was working for Ferrari for three years and I was in Monaco. And I was always in a black T-shirt and jeans turning up on a motorbike. For some stupid reason, I woke up one day and I thought to myself, even though my company was already seven years old and working with some of the biggest brands in the planet, I suddenly thought to myself, my God, I look stupid. People aren't going to take me seriously. I went out shopping and in the space of a week, I think I probably spent about 40 grand on suits. I bought a, a, a Ferrari, a classic Ferrari, um, and I bought, I think, like a you know, 40, 50 grand Audemars PJ watch. And I was the example I mentioned to you earlier of right. all those things were wearing me, you know? Right. I was trying to impress you with the watch. I was trying to impress you with the suit and the car, but it wasn't me. It was, it was literally trying to run up a hill with too much, too much weight on your shoulders. You can't do it very well. You can't perform. And that actually sent me into a spiral. And luckily, and I had the support of my fantastic wife, I realized where the problem was. I had got in the way of myself. And most entrepreneurs, we do the same thing. We get successful, we get into a pattern, everything works, and then we fuck it up. We try to go down a different way, a different... Sorry, I swore, and I know you hate that. But, you know, <laughs> we, went, we went down the wrong path, and we, we, we basically do anything we can to screw up what's working. Why? Because as entrepreneurs, we want the next chapter. We want the next challenge. We want the next shiny object. So that was a dent in my life, and I actually sold myself out, uh, and luckily I got back from it. Um, the other one was a bankruptcy in um, 2005. I, had, I was in Florida. I had two, This is all documented, so anyone can Google this. Um, I had two owners in, um, sorry, three owners in uh, a Bluefish. And the concierge company, just for people yeah, who don't know. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. For, yeah. I had three owners, me being the biggest shareholders, the others owning, I think, like 9% between them. So, so okay. let's pause there. How come you had multiple owners at that time? Like, what was the... But we had, no, so what had happened was two clients had actually purchased some rather big things... Mm. And then they turned around and then they canceled them and we had to send them the money back. And they literally said, oh, I'll just sit it there. And they never spent it. And it was there for like about a year and a half. Mm. And uh, both of them, similar situations. And they both turned around and said, look, we wouldn't mind being part of the company. And I said, well, all right, we're going to expand in a couple of things. And so we literally just decided to give one of them 4% and one of them 5%. And mm. it was just a, I'd known that, and here was the thing, like all stories on this, I've known the guys for like 10 years, mm. okay? So having them cut, there was very little paperwork done. We didn't need the money. They got 9%, which was like no control whatsoever. Right. And then one of them met this business coach who said that basically he could get the company sold and what they should do is try to get me kicked out of the company. So they told me that if they wanted to split their ownership between their parents, because that way it was better taxation for them. Yep. So they did the paperwork, and basically it took their 5% and split it between three of them, and the other guy between two of them, mm. which now meant that there were six owners in Bluefish, even though, again, 91%, okay? But a five-to-one ruling now came on to try and get... So basically they built themselves up a majority. Mm. And they did it because I'd lived in Switzerland um, and I knew all about, you know, uh, numbered accounts and all these kind of things, you know, when I was living there. They started laying on thick and heavy that I was money laundering. Basically, they threw, they threw a shitstorm at me. Mm. And so uh, a trustee was appointed and it was put into, I think it's like a 13 where the company just suspends. Yep. Um, it took a month, one month before the judge realized it was collusion in an effort to steal the company and reversed it and we got our company back. Okay? Mm. Great. But when someone slits your tires, you're still running flat. 
Right. <laughs> and so once you get into any kind of bankruptcy proceedings, okay, this takes two years to get through at a minimum, okay? I think it took us maybe three, um, but the bulk of it was done in two. Even though one month afterwards we'd got our company back, yeah. we were now under trusty uh, supervision for two years. Who's going to send money to a company that's under a bankruptcy trustee? Right. So <laughs> it, it was, we, we learned a lot. We learned about the way the system works. We learned how it can basically strangle you while still trying to kind of feed you at the same time. Mm. Um, we learned about collusion. We learned about contracts. So I learned a lot of things from there. I learned a lot of fair weather clients who were like, oh, sorry, Steve, you know, I don't think I can. And then there were other clients who would say, we don't care. If you tell me it's going to be done, it's going to be done. And you know the funny thing was? The richer clients that I had, like I had clients who were billionaires and I had clients who were millionaires. The millionaires were the skittish ones. Yeah. You know, the billionaires that said, hey, I remember speaking to one client and I said to him, I said, look, you know, I've got to tell you the truth here, pal. I said, I'm now under a trusty uh, supervision for the next two years uh, for Bluefish. He literally turned around to me and said, who the fuck's Bluefish? <laughs> and I said, well, it's, it's the concierge company. And he said, no, 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 no. You're the concierge company. I send my money to you. He said, I don't care what company you're hiding behind. I send my money to you. He said, if it goes well, it's because of you. If it fucks up, I'm coming for you. And I went, fine, works for me. So I learned a lot about people's position. I learned a lot about people's mentality. But those were the two biggest things. Um, and it was funny because under the trustee's help, what we did was we did a, sa a sale of assets into mm. a new company and then let that one go mm. and just started again with a fresh entity. Again, Bluefish. Um, but it was very, very weird. And I really thought to myself, oh, this is the... And no clients got affected. No clients got hurt. Um, no one got hurt. Um, but it was a very, very revealing time for me. So there's two of them. One I sold myself out and the other one I got sold out. Hmm. Yeah, I think, that's, uh, I think that's really interesting, actually. So what is... Do you think a lot of people um, make similar mistakes like that? Or do you think it was just kind of like a... Uh, you just got shit out of luck? It doesn't sound like a fairly common problem. I've never heard that before, actually. Um, I'm sure you ask, you know, a bunch of people. Like, when I actually went to, one of the good things was that when I actually, and one of the big lessons I learned was to talk to people. Mm. You know, and this comes down to, again, your network. So when this shit happened, I literally, within a couple of minutes, were able to phone up some of the biggest um, and most... Uh, um, influential attorneys in New York um, that I knew and go, hey, this has happened. And they went, okay, you know, we'll throw you a bone. We got a guy down there. He's going to come in and represent you. Had I not had someone of that status, then it may not have gone my way um, yeah. because they did some investigating. They did some stuff. They went along to the trustee. The trustee said something because most government officials don't want to do anything. You know, mm -hmm. they want to go and have lunch. But this guy was like, I need to present this document, this document, this email. We found this. We've sourced this. And basically did all of the magistrate's job for him so they could go, yes, you're correct. Struck off. You've now got the company back. Um, Interesting. Had I not had him. And I spoke to a lot of other friends, and they had had similar situations where people would try to kick them out of a company to gain a contract or right. to, you know. And we all know it. We've all had staff and employees that have left and set yeah. up their own company yeah. with your ideas, yeah. your knowledge, your... So I don't think this is uncommon. Mine was big because, it, because we're, we're a high-profile company, working yeah. with billionaires. So mine was big, but who hasn't been screwed over by one of their employees within that time? That's, that's what I want to talk about um, for a second. I have a lot of people in my own network that come to me because being online is so crowded. I try to tell people, like, you are one of probably thousands of people that have the same idea, same offer, same look, same wording, same sales page, same webinar as a thousand other people. Um, and so because of that, it's very difficult to differentiate yourself. And people will come to me and they'll say, 
um, they're worried. They're like frantic. They're like, how do I compete in such a highly competitive market? Or what do I do? Because someone just took my idea. Um, what would you say to someone who is fighting for their life, whether because someone took their idea and is trying to start a new company or they're in a really overcrowded market and they feel like they're not going to be able to take their company as far as they want to take it. What would you say to someone in that situation? So you've really got to work out where the competition is. I've had Mm -hmm. a lot of similar to you. I get a lot of people that come to me and they go, Hey, you know, there's a lot of people that are similar to me. Well, that's your ass fault. You know, (laughs) if that's similar to you, it's because you look like (laughs) everyone else. Yeah. Um, the bottom line of it is you're, you're very different when you speak and you'll always be very different. The way you, you do your videos, the way you interact. Are you talking about me? Yeah, I'm talking about oh. you because <laughs> you're you. Yeah. You haven't tried to be somebody else. Hmm. Now, the first problem is how are you trying to emulate? So when someone says, oh, it's a crowded market, how the fuck can it be crowded? You know, are there loads of other British bald people out there with, in, in motorbikes and tattoos and stuff, you know, dealing with Elon Musk? No. Okay. So you first of all got to look at what are your identifiers? What is your unicorn? And expose that, you know? Mm. Back. You're back? Yep. Yeah. Yep. You got good. Okay. So, oh, sorry, something happened. No, I'm here. I can hear you. All right. the, a, there was a funny reverb there going on. Can you hear an echo? No. Okay, it's caught up now. There was an echo. I apologize. All right, so you've got to understand what your unicorn is. You've got to understand what is different to you to everybody else. Mm. You've got to try and uh, expose that. So do the videos in your copy. All of those things should say, this is who I am. Don't compete. Don't even try to compete. Um, how do you defend, uh, differentiate yourself? You be you. That's the first thing. By being you, you're individual. You, you, can't be cha- you can't be changed. Regarding the information that other people are taking, so I've got a really bad echo. Can you, are you, are you getting an echo? No. Right, okay. Very strange. Everybody comment. Let us know if there's an echo, but I can hear you just fine. Oh, yeah, let me know if there is, because I can hear myself in the back, and I'm annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so when somebody steals your property, when someone steals your, uh, your worksheets, when anybody actually uh, tries to take that, sooner or later is going to look around and someone's going to go, well, where did you get that information? And they will find you. Mm. Also, what you've got to bear in mind is you designed this. Right. You put this together. Okay, what you put on paper is 40% of what's going on up here. So, yeah, you can take my sheets, you can take uh, the copies. Let's be blunt 99% of the worksheets on the planet are all the bloody same, they all look the same. Yeah, so when those go out, it's the follow up, it's the mentality behind it, it's the process behind it, and they can't take that. Yeah, so I remember when I first met you, one of the questions that you asked me was, What was my biggest failure? But you also asked me, like, what made me different than everybody else? And I did my best. I mean, at the, at the time, I was a little caught off guard. Um, but I was like, uh, uh, this is what makes me different, I think. Um, so speaking to that, you're online. You've commented and let me know that he thinks, uh, Steve guys thinks that I'm awkward on camera. I think I thrive <laughs> on camera, but whatever. Uh, you've seen my stuff, but more importantly, you've seen everybody else's shit. And they, um, some people posts and they're doing really well and some people you can just tell are just throwing shit at the wall and then hope that it sticks so um being that you're online i know it's not your specialty per se but you're observant you worked with really successful people what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes that people are making online with their branding or with their marketing in general oh okay so for a start being online is my speciality oh okay my bad my bad yeah no 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 (laughs) But let me, the reason it's my speciality is because it's just me, okay? Mm. My speciality is me being me absolutely anywhere. Mm. (laughs) So I see a lot of people out there that actually, they try to brand and they try to market by copying other people. So the first thing is they, they throw the beanies on, they put a suit on, they lean against a fancy car. They try to be everyone else. And they lack the ability to just call it as it is. 
Now, I will put quotes up on my Instagram page, and that's spelt badly. <laughs> and I'll have people saying, I get your point, but you can't spell for shit, Steve. And I'll be like, True. yeah, that's right. Right. But <laughs> Me too. it doesn't matter because it comes through. It is what it is. Right. The point is still valid. So I don't put much effort into trying to brand and market me. I put mm -hmm. all my effort in being me. And that, again, makes me individual. So if you follow that all the way through and you stay true to you and you stay transparent to who you are and what you mean and what you're doing and what you're solving, people will resonate to it and you'll end up with a tighter, more loyal crowd. Okay, so you think that one of the biggest mistakes people are making online is that they are trying too hard to brand themselves. Way too hard. And trying to copy other people. So what about the people that... Um, another question that you asked me was when you were, we were talking about growing my own company, you said, cool, but like, what's your authority? What's your credibility? How do I know that your results are actually legitimate? And I was like, well, don't you worry because I've got these video testimonials, but that's because I've been in business for years. And, um, I've been, I, I kind of got a little bit of a head start before my market became overly crowded, but there's a lot of people that are just trying to get started and they don't have authority or credibility meaning they don't have like testimonials yet. They don't have proven results, but they still want to be in their niche, whether it's they want to help people with their businesses. They want to teach people fitness. They want to provide some level of service, but they don't have that credibility yet. Um, and so it's hard online to get people to trust you and to listen to your stuff. If at the same time, you don't have the credibility um, or testimonials to back it up. I know. And you asked me that specifically, you know, how could I prove it? to you um, as, as well as to everybody else that I'm legit. So what, what would you recommend to the people that are just beginning that, cause I know you were in a similar circumstance where you're trying to get connected to the world's richest people, but you were nobody at the time. What can someone do that is a nobody that doesn't have testimonials, doesn't have authority or credibility, but still wants to get their business off the ground. What can they do in their marketing to make that happen and establish trust with people? So it's obvious that once you've got traction and testimonials, things become a lot easier. Yeah, just it's, it's, a lot easy, it's a lot easier for me to open up the White House or, you know, the academia now because I've got that credibility. In the early stages, you're correct, you don't have it. So, but what you've got to do is stop focusing on the brand, stop focusing on the marketing, and focus on what you're solving. The bottom line of it is, if you've got a headache and I've got a headache tablet, do you care what package it's in? Do you care about how pretty the website is? You care that it solves the problem. So focus on what you're solving. Whatever you're doing, get out there and call the problem out. Good copy says, hey, you know, do you have this problem? I have the solution. Now, we know for well, you've got to build up traction. So you'll get one client. You'll get three clients. You'll get four clients. You'll ask the three testimonials. And then it will start getting, but you focus on the solution. Uh, when I was watching you, when I was watching your credibility, and we mm. could all get great testimonials, I've noticed a scam going out there now. Have you, have you come across a, um, a, a company called Cameo? I don't think so. So Cameo, and I'm on there, it's all different uh, influencers, uh, actors, Grant Cardone's on there. I don't know if Gary Vee's on there. A whole bunch of people on there. And you can actually pay money and tell them what you want them to do, and they will give you a shout-out. I won't do a shout-out for business, but I get people say, hey, can you wish Julia a happy birthday? And I'll go and go, hey, Julia, I always thought I wish you a happy birthday. And they pay you. It's like 15 or 20 bucks or something like that. <laughs> but a lot of people now are starting to use Cameo to go, hey, Julia, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work you're doing. It's helped me a lot. And then they're cropping it and sticking on that testimonial pages. No. So, oh yeah, cameo. I've seen it. I've seen a lot of people using Grant Cardone for that. Okay, and I saw no, one by. Uh, he's a, he, yeah. Anyways. Well, yeah, but they were using Grant Cardone to, and Paris Hilton. That's that speaks a lot to who Grant is, though. Knowing that you know you're going to film this tes testimonial for someone, and they're going to leverage it to. Besides the point, though, um, it's not a, a shit. Fest but that's right. what they're doing. They you. We all want testimonials. We. There's nothing ever better than someone else saying good things about you. Nothing's ever going to be better than that. <clears throat> but in the early stages, focus on solving the problem and creating some loyalty behind that and then use them for solution, uh, testimonials so you can start promoting it. 
Yeah, and to be clear, you're not promoting that people go on Cameo and get fake testimonials, are you? I will call them out. I, okay. I've actually, I've had clear. a couple of, yeah, I've had a few people go on, uh, been doing that. And as I say, one was done by Paris Hilton. Um, sorry, Paris Hilton. So I actually went on there and said, uh, did you get this from Cameo? And I put the link for Paris Hilton on there. And he, he contacted me and he said, you shouldn't have done that. And I said, no, you shouldn't have done that. You know, right. you've dented your credibility. Get that the fuck off your Facebook page now and focus on doing it really. So he did. Right. So when someone is focusing on solving the problem, but I'll go back to the fact that they don't have testimonials. I know because when I was getting started, I was constantly hit with it where it was like people would say things like that's great copy and it sounds good, right? It looks like it can help me, but how do I know for sure? And as the marketplace gets more and more crowded with people that are all offering the same thing as a consumer, because I, I invest in all sorts of stuff to grow my business. For example, one of the recent things that I did was hire uh, someone to help me manage and lead my team better. Um, and I've paid mm, probably over six figures now, and he's done wonders with that, right? But one of the things that I was doing was I was literally doing phone calls with people, and I was like, look, this is my problem with my team. This is what I'm looking to accomplish. I don't know how to do this properly. Can you help me? And I also own several other companies, so he was – working with all of the companies and all the teams. Um, and the thing I was looking for is I was like, okay, yeah, that sounds really great. I was like, that's fantastic. It seems like you can help me, but how do I know for sure? Like I was always waiting for that last little bit of like, well, I also worked with this one company and like some testimonial to seal the deal um, because there were so many people that were offering the same thing. So um, from the consumer side, it's really hard to make a decision about who to work with and who not to work with if, if, they all look the same. None of them have testimonials or they all have the same testimonials. It's very difficult to choose. So um, what can be kind of like that final or what do you think is that final like, uh, what is it, nail in the coffin for a consumer who's like looking at a million people and they're trying to decide which service provider to go to. None of them really have testimonials. They all look the same. What's that nail in the coffin that the service provider can do to land that client? All right, so the first thing um, is when you're that young in business, you've got to put more effort into your business than when it's running well with traction. We all know that. Yeah. You've really got to get into communication with the end user, the client, the customer. And so you've got to be able to reach out to them and go, hey, I know there are others out there, and I know I'm pretty young in this space, but I'd like to get on the phone and let you know why this is important to me. You've got to, not your top salespeople, but in the early stages, you've got to be the one that picks the phone and says, hey, I know you're looking around to getting this done. I, now, you may have to turn around and go, look, this is my fee. You can pay 50% now and 50% afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not a great believer in discounting. I'll give you extra, you yeah. know, but I don't like this. If I'm charging a thousand bucks, I'm not going to say, hey, use me. I'll pay you 750. But in the early stages, I may have turned around and gone, hey, pay me $750 now and $250 afterwards, you know? Hey. So, but get on the phone and talk to them. Tell them why it's important for you to solve that problem. Yep. I think that, um, that's one thing I always did when I was getting started was <laughs> people knew I didn't have a lot of testimonials. And I, for a long time, I think, try to, like, overcompensate with my content and overcompensate on my sales calls and pretend like I had – um, a lot more going for me than I did at the time. And I've told people, but it took me seven months for each of my businesses that I started to get a single paying client. Like I couldn't get someone to pay me a dollar. Um, and so the thing that I started doing was exactly what she said. I'd get on the phone and at the end, you know, I could always tell that they were waiting for that testimonial and I addressed it head on instead of lying or making up a testimony or anything. I was like, look, I'm brand new. And frankly, I believe that I can help you. I believe I can get you results, but I'm brand new at this. Um, I want to make that clear now because I'm brand new. I'm going to give you 100% of my time, my time and 100% of my dedication to make this happen. And usually that in and of itself, that honesty was the nail in the coffin. That was the differentiator because so many other people out there are overcompensating. They're overstating their results. They can't back it up. Uh, they have fake testimonials. So if you're the one person that's honest and you're like, look, I'm brand new at this or, hey, you know, this is kind of outside my normal, but I think I can help you. Usually, I mean, I found that to be like the final nail in the coffin um, as well. So I do definitely agree with that.
I believe that our stomach is more intelligent than our head. I know it sounds weird, yeah. but we have, a, we have a gut reaction to something. We, pull, we walk past a hedge and the hedge rustles and, and we're on alert, you know? Yeah. We don't know why, but we react. When something's not right, we get butterflies in our stomach. Mm. Now, our eyes are telling us he's got a new car, he's got a nice suit, he's got a $50,000 watch. And our eyes are going, well, in that case, ka-ching, he must have money. Yep. Um, but our stomach goes, mm, something shady about this guy. I don't quite try. Focus on your gut. When you phone someone and go, hey, I'm new. I've been working in the industry Honestly. for 10 years, but I've come out and I'm working on my own now because I saw a couple of areas that weren't being catered for, weren't being looked after. I've got the experience, but my business is new. You can go with another company. In fact, I'll recommend you to other companies that are good, but you're going to be best served working with someone that's here to solve. Right. And just be very direct. I'm a great believer in getting the elephant out of the room. You know, you walk in and go, hey, if your budget is $50,000, then you're wrong. You know, you need to be working on quarter of a million dollars because these are the results you should be looking at, not these. So I believe there's a great reason to go in there and attack with transparency. All right. So I have a couple more questions. First being, um, what would be, like, if you had to make a blanket statement and be like, this is my piece of advice to all the entrepreneurs out there watching this live video uh, that want to succeed, that want to go far. I know the world's richest men. Um, what would that piece of advice be? I'm going to give you the advice that was given to me by probably one of the thickest roughnecks that has ever been known to mankind, my dad. Okay. Um, <laughs> He turned around to me in a, in, a, in a moment of weirdness and said, son, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. And that stuck with me. And every now and then when I would fall over and I'd be immersed in self-pity and woe is me and shit's gone wrong, I've realized, okay, I'm in the water. Do I stay and drown or do I get out? And that empowerment of getting out of those problems makes you stand taller. I'm probably about 33 feet tall by now, but mm. uh, I'm a great believer that you should always, um, you know, focus on the, that empowerment you gain. Yep. Because if I lose a million bucks tomorrow, okay, now this is going to sound very blasé, fuck cares. Because I've, I know how to make a million bucks. So if I lose you it tomorrow, it. I'll just do what I did before because I've done it many times before. So... That empowerment, and so I would say that, you know, it's not the water you've got to be worried about, it's staying there. Yeah, so I want to point something out because I think you, you give a lot of, like, really awesome tips in there, um, but people, they don't listen carefully enough, so I want to point some things out. Uh, one thing that Steve said in that is that if he lost a million dollars, he wouldn't panic because he knows how to make a million dollars, and I think that that speaks to the concept of, like, when you know what works, literally growing your business oftentimes is as simple as doing more of what works over and over and over again. So Steve wouldn't panic because he's made a million dollars before he knows what it takes to go out and make another million dollars. If you lost a client tomorrow, you shouldn't panic because you've landed clients before. So a lot of growing your business is just doing more of what works and less of what doesn't. And I think Steve touched on that a little bit, but I want to point that out. Um, that's a really, really big thing but I don't think a lot of people exercise it as much as they should they oh they overthink it they're like things not growing I must use, need this new tech I must need this new thing I must need this I I gotta get Facebook ads and I gotta hire this guy I gotta hire that guy and the only time that you should hire or add to what you're already doing is if something is broken or you've already maxed out everything that you're doing you shouldn't be adding to it or or fixing or investing into your company if it's working if it's growing uh you just yep. need to optimize at that stage so it's more optimized before you maximize and steve talks about that a lot um but steve you have an event coming up in november correct i do the speakeasies do you have any spots left uh we have 10 now we have 10, 10 left spots. there's a maximum of 40 so we've already got i think we've got 29 or 30 i don't know if the guy yesterday uh paid through but i think so we've got 10 spots left all right so quick backstory of how I met Steve. I don't actually remember, but we got connected for, through a mutual friend. And my friend, Manny Wolf, was like, hey, Steve's having this event. And uh, here's the website. You should check it out. I was like, okay, cool. So I went and I bought my ticket thinking that my friend was going to go with me. 
And my friend backed out at the last minute. I was like, okay, no big deal. <laughs> I'm kind of an introvert. So I'm kind of like, maybe I should back out too. Like I was looking for excuses. I was like, oh, my dog is sick and he looks depressed today. Um, and then I was like, you know what, I'm going to go because I made this concept, this idea this year that I wanted to make more relationships, get out there more, just do stuff with my life. And uh, the instructions for the very first time I ever met Steve was literally this. I, I don't, might not be verbatim, but pretty close. It was like, I want you to wear something comfortable, no heels. Here's the address. Meet me on the sidewalk. That's it. He's like, we're going to go to LA, to Hollywood. We've never met before. Here's the address. I'll meet you on the sidewalk. And then, and then I pull up, right? And so I'm like driving and I'm like, oh, right, this is no, I'm just going to meet a strange dude on the sidewalk, which if you don't know me, Go back and watch some of my videos, you guys. Meeting a strange man on the sidewalk is way outside my comfort zone. I was and this is anyway. a strange man. Right, right. <laughs> and plus the eyebrow here, the whole thing was like, I was like, I don't know what the fuck I just signed up for. I'm driving up. Well, my Uber is pulling up. And it's not like we went, we must have gone the back way because we were like going down some alleys. And I'm starting to get very physically nervous. <laughs> uh, anyways, I showed up and had the time of my life. We ended up doing some very awesome things at that event. I learned a lot, met a lot of cool people. And the one thing that I love about Steve's event, my favorite part is that the people that Steve attracts to his circle and to his event are always top notch. So they're almost always at the top of their industry. They're not like people that are like not that great or like struggling or just kind of like using fake testimonials. They're almost always people at the top of their industry. But more importantly, they're like really top level people as a whole like in their personal life they give back to charity they're very generous they're very kind they're accepting um and they're fucking fun and uh i love that every event that i've gone to with steve i'm blown away with the quality of people and that's something that i look for because i'm an introvert and um i'm trying to get out there more make some friends you know it's it's working out for me a little bit but uh I've always been blown away, not only by the stuff that we get to do when we attend Steve's events, but the people that go. And so he's throwing an event in November, and I'll let him speak to it. But you guys, I will be at that event in November. I don't know if that tells you anything, um, if that's incentive to come, because I'll be there. Um, but I have no doubt that on top of the quality of people that will be there, that the events will blow you away. So I'll let Steve explain a little bit about, more about what's going to happen in November if any of you guys are interested in coming with us. Well, let me, let me ask you to tell the folks, what do you know you're doing in Silicon Valley for a start? Um, I think you said the words, it's tech related. That's it. Three words. <laughs> and then, so and then he gives a dress code. He says, it's this related dress like this, which I never am able to follow that dress code. But besides the point. <laughs> you just like the free shirts. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I did was the speakeasy concept is that we try to attract a similar mindset of people by having them challenged as much as possible. So we've done them all over New York, um, San Diego, Reno recently. We're doing this next one in Silicon Valley. We're actually hosting it in San Francisco, but we're going down to Silicon Valley. A little bit of a clue there. Um, and the way that I try to operate is it's two grand, two days, amazing access, amazing conversations, amazing people. And we want people to be a little bit challenged to who are they going to meet? What are they going to do? Because they're mm. more open-minded. And when we did the LA one, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, um, the LA one, I think we had uh, 30, I think it was 36 people there. We mm. never go over 40. Yeah. Um, and uh, we turned down 17 people. So the funny thing is, if you go to stevedsims.com, click on next event, You'll see the details about Speakeasy Silicon Valley. Yeah. It just says 14th and 15th of November, I'm in. It yep. gives no details. <laughs> we will contact you and say, okay, what's your bottleneck? What's your problem? And for LA, we had people going, well, I want to meet this superstar. And oh, I want to get my photograph here. And oh, I want to know how to you know, get Elon Musk to write forward on my book. We get rid of those people. Because yeah. as far as I'm concerned... More important than the amazing access that you get, more important than the people that come and help you with your problems, the most important, the pinnacle of any good event is the people sitting in the seats. 
the people you're going to have coffee with, the people you're going to share a cocktail with, the people you're going to share chocolate cake with at midnight, those are the people that are important <laughs> and make the whole event. So, you know, it does seem a little bit kind of like, woo, and people are going to contact me because they always do and go, can you tell me a little bit about it? And they will get no. a response along the lines of, no. Right. <laughs> um, but it's too grand. If you want to join top level people that are out there because they know I won't let you down, then come along and play. Yeah. So uh, I'll speak to that. Um, don't ask me what we're doing because I don't know. Um, don't ask no Steve. one does. Yeah, don't ask Steve what, what <laughs> we're doing because he's not going to tell you. If that bothers you, if you're the type that needs to know, you need an itinerary, you need to like plan it out and dress accordingly and mentally prepare, this is not the event for you. Um, but if you're kind of like, I like getting uncomfortable, I like meeting good people, I'm willing to do something, make a small investment in comparison to the experience that you get, not just the access, but again, the people, make a small investment in comparison to everything that you get with that so that you can grow yourself as a human being and ultimately grow your business, then this might be the event for you. Um, what I will tell you guys is that Steve is freaking awesome and you might feel compelled to try to be his best friend, but I just want to let you guys all know that that spot has been taken by me. So if you do come to this event and you're like, I'm going to come, Juliet's going to be there and I'm going to be Steve's best friend. It's too late. <laughs> spot already filled. Um, but you are more than welcome to come in and flatter us with compliments and gifts and trying to get into the inner circle, but it's up to you guys. Um, let's just make sure there's no questions here. Chocolate cake at midnight. Yeah, that's an inside joke, Christina. Um, we get a you got to be there. You, you, you just got to be there. That's that. <laughs> You, 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 you either know or you don't know. Yeah, so. I'll, drop a, I'll drop a comment with a picture of this, this T-shirt and tell you guys a story of what, what happened at the last event um, <laughs> that I fucked up. And then the last, last event, I also held up the entire bus. So I'll try not to do this this time, but Steve, how can someone get access to this event if they're interested? So again, very easy, stevedsims.com and then click on the link that says next event. And I'm pretty sure I'll probably post it Perfect. Uh, in this when the recording's over. It'll give you some details. We did actually put a little video up there because a lot of people were asking me about it. So there is a, now a link on that page that says, what is a speakeasy? Mm. And you can get a little bit of a blurb and you can see me talking about it. And you can see some little pictures on the side of some of the things that we got up to. I'm happy to tell people what we've got up to in the past, yeah. but I never tell people what they're going to get up to in the future events. Yep. Perfect. All right, you guys. Well, Steve, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you today. Um, I know I threw some questions in there and I did ask you in advance. I was like, hey, man, you tell me if there's anything off limits, but I appreciate your participation. Um, if you guys want to attend the event, we'll drop the link up for you guys to apply below. You do have to be top notch and really, really awesome. Um, otherwise, you'll be kicked out. But if you are top notch and awesome, go ahead and apply to Steve's next event. That's in November. And I will see you guys later. Thanks, Steve.